Hello, and welcome to this episode of Clarity, the Undistorted Truth About Dementia. Today, we're going to talk about reality orientation and finding the right lines of how to bring someone into reality or to correct statements that they might be making that are not founded in reality and where kind of where to find those lines. This is something a lot of people tend to struggle with. Um, they tend to say things like, should I just lie to them or I can't bring myself to lie to them and what should I say? So this is something that we're going to hopefully answer all of those questions today. If we have not answered your questions, please email us. We would love to do some episodes where we're answering questions from real people. So um, feel free to email in to DementiaUndistorted at gmail.com and we'd be happy to answer your questions. So let's dive into reality orientation. Uh, this is probably a concept that you are familiar with, even if you're not familiar with the terminology, um, because a lot of people experience this. So uh, an example of orienting someone to reality would be if they say the sky is green, you say, no, the sky is blue. You're talking about what is factually true in the moment. Um, there's, uh, there's some people um, are very like die hard and believe that this is the way to be honest with people and that um, it's not appropriate to, to lie to anyone and um, they're going to orient to reality at all costs. I don't believe that this is an appropriate approach. Um, I haven't seen enough evidence of it being successful to advocate for this to happen all the time. Um, that said, I also really don't believe in lying to people. If you have watched our video about emotions, um, we're going to reference that quite a bit. If you haven't watched it, it's okay, but I would encourage you to watch it because the, the, the two, two concepts, concepts are going to walk, walk hand, hand in hand because ultimately our goal in correcting, re in orienting to reality um, is going to have an emotional drive to it. We, we want, want people, people to trust us. We, we want, want to bring comfort. We want, want to bring reassurance. And so all of those things have to do with the emotional experience um, that they are having. So um, some examples that we run into, um, and this will kind of answer that question of does it work or not. Um, so like some, some scenarios that, that are common are looking for people, um, either people who have passed or children who need to be picked up from school who are grown, um, needing to go do something for someone, needing to get somewhere. There's usually a goal or a concern, and we're going to talk about why that is later in the video, um, but that's usually where the statements um, that are not grounded in reality are coming from, is the need to, to do something or see someone. And um, if we're just going to jump in with both feet, uh, the one that is the most emotionally charged tends to be when someone is looking for a family member, particularly a spouse um, or a child who has passed. And here's here's kind of that, uh, that way to judge, does reality orientation work? So if someone says, I'm looking for Fred, and Fred has been gone for 10 years, and you say, well, Fred's not here, he died. Uh, that's about probably the last time you're going to say something like that, uh, because it can be absolutely devastating. Um, usually, you get a response that is either, um, you know, grief and horror, uh, like someone is being told in this news for the first time, or there is mistrust and disbelief, and they don't think that you know who they're talking about. Um, you must be talking about somebody else, and what good are you if you don't even know who I'm talking about? Or there is suspicion, because if this person says Fred died before I even know about it, they must have had something to do with it. So this is particularly true for people in advanced, um, the, it, who are advanced in their disease process. 
Um, people who are less advanced, um, I have seen people be successful um, kind of walking them into reality when they're looking for Fred and they say something like, do you remember what year it is? Or do you remember what town we're in? And kind of walking them through some other things surrounding the situation where they say, oh yeah, Fred's been gone for a while. Um, I've seen that be successful in, in people, like I said, who are not very advanced in their process. And that's okay. Absolutely, that's okay. Um, the most important thing is to be kind and reassuring and comforting while they're getting there because those emotions are going to linger just like the negative emotions are going to linger if we are direct and harsh and to the point there can be some negativity we want to be um, that source of love and compassion and comfort for someone while they're trying to rationalize so that that's a big one um, what I tend to do rather than pick either side of that fence um, is because I don't believe in lying. Um, I don't believe that that is effective. Um, again, we can talk about emotions. I never say something like, oh, well, Fred's at the store. He's going to come back because if I'm caught in that lie, then even when someone doesn't remember why they don't trust me, this goes back to our emotions video, even if you don't remember the facts of the event, you remember the feelings that linger. So if mistrust is the feeling, even if they don't remember why, then then I, I'm no longer a person that is trustworthy. Um, it's going to be more difficult for me to, um, to do the things that are um, important and necessary for caregiving um, if that person is suspicious and mistrusting of me. So instead of joining either of those camps, um, and to avoid lying, so to avoid lying and avoid telling the whole truth, I tell people often, look for the gray area. Because what you're trying to communicate again is that emotional response. Because I know Fred's not coming back. Um, I say something along these lines often, which is, you know, I haven't seen him. When they say, have you seen Fred? I haven't seen him. But I'll tell you as soon as I do, or I'll be on the lookout for him. I know I'm not going to see him, but what that communicates is that I care about their problems. I'm on their side. I want what they want. And that elicits trust. That puts me in a position of being someone that is helpful to them, who's a resource to them, someone who is, has their interests in mind. Um, so then when we need to do some other things, like, um, like if I need to make food for them, and because uh, some, for some people eating is a challenge, they're going to be more accepting of what I offer. Um, if I need to help them with some personal care, I'm no longer a suspicious person, I'm a trusting person. And you can let some of those um, walls down with someone that you trust. So that's why I communicate in that way. So we're going to take that concept and talk about other things. So let's talk about looking for children who are grown. You know, there are people who have great-grandchildren in school, but they'll say, it's 3 o'clock, I need, I need to pick up my kids. Nobody's going to be there for them. Um, I don't say, oh, your kids are grown. Who Like, does that mean anything? I'm essentially a stranger to them. If they're this advanced in their process, me saying this, that this is not correct, um, you're going to look at me like I'm a crazy person. How do you know what's going on with my kids? Um, did you do something with my kids? Is there some plot afoot? Um, so, so again, I don't want to say that, and I also don't want to say, oh, they've caught the bus, they'll be here shortly. Because that is eliciting some anticipation, anticipation that is never going to be fulfilled, which leads to anxiety, and that's the train that we set in motion. So again, that gray area, I'll say something like, oh, do you know what? We still have a little bit of time. Let's grab some coffee first. And then I use coffee, you know, that time to, to pour some coffee and visit to redirect the conversation somewhere else. Something that has nothing to do with the kids. Maybe I use one more step with the kids as a segue into a different conversation. Um, 
or I just bring them into a completely different room where I'm pouring that coffee, and then we start a whole different conversation. Sometimes this takes a few redirects to get there, uh, but eventually we can get there. Um, let's talk about why we see these be the common things that people need orientation, um, so the situations you need uh, that are surrounding the need for orientation. They're usually caused by anxiety. And just because there is anxiety present does not always need mean there's a need for medication. Some people need medication for anxiety. Some people don't. That is a conversation to have with your doctor to determine the severity of the anxiety um, and to look for patterns of when people become more anxious. Um, but we don't want to just jump on this, this wagon of, oh, they're anxious, let's medicate them. Or also the, the opposite of we're just going to power through this, um, you know, because medication is, is what we're going to avoid at all costs. Neither of those is correct or incorrect. It's different for every person. So medication aside, let's talk about behavior. So a lot of people experience what is called sundowning which is a phrase hopefully you've heard by now, but if you haven't, that's okay. Sundowning is when people tend to be less rational. Um, they can have more exaggerated behaviors and they can become more anxious in evening hours. Um, there's a lot of different theories on why this is, um, why, why this happens to someone. Um, there's the kind of the leading theories in this is that it's, you know, directly linked to the amount of light exposure and the way that your eye can process that the way it communicates to your brain, um, sunlight and shadows and different things going on in the physical environment. And then there is also, um, I th which I think the, the two of these are coupled, um, the amount of um, wear and tear that the day has taken on you, you get very tired. So think about when you come home at the end of a long day and how you need to rest and kind of recharge. Otherwise, you start missing things, dropping things. You're not able to multitask very successfully. We all experience that. So if we're starting out our day at a lower cognitive level and then we've gone through all that wear and tear of the through um, throughout the day, then that lower level where we need to rest and recharge is that much lower than someone of in, you know, uh, normal um, cognitive functioning. So, so that's something to consider. A way to avoid situations like this is, is to, to allow, allow time, time throughout, throughout the day for that, that person, person to rest, rest and refresh. refresh. Um, that's, that's a way, way to, to prevent some of these, these. Um, situations from unfolding. It's not going to be um, a magic solution because every body is different, every brain is different, and every disease process is different, but that can be very helpful in preventing these situations is just simply resting. Make sure that someone doesn't over um, rest so that they think that they're, they, you don't want them to think that they're restarting a new day because then that can be its own can of worms in jarring someone and having to orient them. But rest in the middle of the day is going to be um, a really big step forward. So these are kind of just the basics. We're going to do another video um, just for the sake of time and to help digest the information that's um, that we're presenting. We're going to do another video about um, orienting people and managing behaviors. Um, and so be on the lookout for that. In the meantime, please email us your questions, dementiaundistorted at gmail.com. Until next time, we'll see you later.